Welcome to the Westside Barbell Podcast. Today's guest is Jason Gus Gusick, the director and founder of Conjugate Tactical. And for those of you who don't know, Gus was part of the early crew here of putting together the equipment sales team, the seminar team, etc. Gus, pleasure to have you finally here in for a podcast. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, we try to start these around the same way. And the beginning is, how did you end up hearing about Westside? So this dates back to 09 for me. We used to have a CrossFit affiliate back then and we're searching for a way to get stronger. The fitness side was working, everyone's getting healthy, but big weights were still glued to the floor. So um, just searching around the main site back then in the Googles and we found Westside Barbell, dug into that, found the website, started reading articles, got real confused. And that was when the CrossFit powerlifting seminars were still going here. So we came to one of the first, if not the first, one for the public. Mm -hmm. And that was that was it, hooked from there. That was that was the end of the road and start of a new one. Who was there with you? Do you remember? So I came out alone. Okay. I was a rookie cop at the time, so I borrowed our car that we <laughs> had. Um, I don't remember anyone in the audience. I, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't really meet anybody. Was, um, was it just Louie doing the seminars? No, it was Louie. Uh, Laura was on the panel. Uh, AJ, Shane was up there. Chris Mason, Justin Tooley. Um, there was a few more assisting, but that was your main speakers back then. Yeah. Um, so from there, how did you enter the the ecosystem of HQ? So I basically just never left. <laughs> so I came home after that seminar with a stack of books and a whole crap load of questions and would come back out every couple of weeks. It seems like at least once a month just to train, I mean, uh, taking garbages out, whatever yeah. really needed to be done, just to be a fly on the wall and pick things up. Um, and then when we started getting a grasp on, or at least what I hope was a grasp back then, on the methods and applications, we started using them in our gym, uh, in the world of MMA back then. This is 09 to 2012, roughly, running that same process of traveling here, training, running out of the gym. And we were using them for MMA with uh, Eddie. And back then, as uh, the frontier for strength conditioning and MMA, and we, we'd figured out something because this yeah. was on the, the way to the title fight and whatnot. And really from there, it was it just kind of that right place at the right time scenario. And Dana White back in the day used to do the behind the scenes videos with his iPhone. And we're just leaving the sauna. And Eddie was in a hoodie. wasn't a sponsorship or anything. Just yeah. cool. Everyone's got a freaking West Side hoodie. Like, have always, you're not a weight room, bro. I'm sorry. That's just yeah. standard issue at this point. But we're leaving the sauna and the video went posted on Facebook and you guys found it and shared it. And we're like, who the, I'm assuming, I didn't know you're Irish at the time, but who the fuck is this guy? Cause you know, there was really no one doing it outside of the gym down here. And I'd messaged Chris Mason and was like, Hey man, this is everything we were talking about. Like, you know, we're doing this at a pretty high level and I think we know what we're doing. And he's like, Oh, you, you need to go ahead and call the office immediately. <laughs> and so that was when we got, you know, kind of summoned good fellas style that day to come out and train. And we were about 20 minutes late. So, <laughs> and then that's, that was kind of the catalyst for wherever the hell it's gone for the last 10 years now. But that was around 2012, if I remember correctly. And I remember that first interaction we had, uh, you had a pretty good story from that first seminar about you eyeing up books. Yeah. If you could just share that, I thought like that was like, okay, this guy, he gets it. So that, that I mean, it's a fun story, but in hindsight, it's just, I'm kind of dumb. <laughs> so I remember we were wrapping the seminar up and, and I'd, not gotten into it. I mean, it's not grown men fighting each other, but yeah. there was some discontent in the audience with me and some other people because it was, I mean, to make a short answer long, but there, there's too much arguing instead of note taking. And I got a little pissed off and wandered off to the side. And that was when Lou and Chris grabbed me like, dude, what's up? And I was like, man, I'm here to learn. Like, I don't want to argue semantics. Like you guys are real strong. I'm not like, let's yeah. figure this out. So they, they, you know, gave me some, some special attention and it's a lot of learn, a lot of lessons learned. And that was kind of the, the segue from me and the audience to the guy sitting in a chair by himself. And they started setting the table up. And Westside, the business, was way different back then than it is now. And Doris had the table set up. And it was just a, like a four-by-four four folding table with some shirts. I think the, the yellow one, which was not our best seller, I don't think. But a bunch of T-shirts. And there was like three books. There was the Book of Methods, the Science and Practice of Strength Training, and I want to say Explosive Jumping Ability by Zatziorski. Mm -hmm. And I only saw three books. And in hindsight, there was probably a lot of copies, but I saw three and was like, those are, those are my effing books. <laughs> so we broke, the seminar was done, and everyone's making their way to the table. And I'm 
bullshit. Like I'm getting yeah. So I got my three books thinking it was going to be a slug fest to get them. And no one, no one cared. They went for <laughs> t-shirts and pictures. And I didn't know Lou hated pictures at the time, yeah. but I just wanted those books. You yeah. know? So I beeline for the book. So I like to think that that was, you know, hopefully kind of like the, I didn't make an impression, but it, it planted a seed somewhere. Yeah. And then during some of those visits coming back from 09 to 2012, uh, we come back and Lou's like, Hey, you were at the seminar. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you bought the books. I'm like I did. And he's like, good. M more yeah. people need to read books. And then, you know, all right, get in there, <laughs> lift weights. <laughs> and it just kind of, you know, those kind of stories just repeated over and over and over again, but the power of reading the power of books. So when you were, um, when we were selling equipment before deal with rogue, you had two roles. Like you had well multiple, but there was Jason, the our guy selling equipment and educating, and we always led with education. Mm -hmm. Then the sale, if it happened, great. If not, yeah. they got an education. But then there was Jason, the coach. How was that to balance going through here? Honestly, I, I don't think we would have had our early success. You know, and that's a dangerous term, but I don't think we would have had our level of success with equipment if it was not backed with with coaching. Mm -hmm or education, either from a sm as a small business owner running my gym and e even, you know, through all, all the dialogues of equipment sales is there's the human performance aspect to everything. And then the business owner aspect of, you know, we, we just spent three G's on a machine or whatever it was, but you better get that back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, big deadlifts are great, but we, so we were able to guide a lot of people more on decision making than just forcing a machine down their throat. And I remember getting not my ass chewed, but we had some sidebars about Sometimes we told people not to buy stuff yeah. and we had to, you know, kind of compass check, like morally, that's the right thing to do. Even though the book tells you sell, 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 you know, all that. We're like, no, that, that guy doesn't need a 12th reverse hyper. Yeah. Like, he needs an inverse curl. So being able to educate people on the performance side and then share some experiential elements of having these pieces in my location or this location or being able to pair, you know, we, we set up, I don't know how many phone calls of you know, so-and-so has an inverse curl. You're yeah. an hour and a half from him. Go down there and try it. He's waiting for you. And he'll answer questions about what it did for his business, all that kind of stuff. So I don't think that we would have moved the volume of equipment over those years that mm -hmm. we did if it wasn't piggybacked off of teaching people about the equipment. So it was almost getting one for yourself as an afterthought. Like, yeah. Because, I mean, we'd also have hour-long conversations on teaching people how to use the machines that they'd lead with, I'm not buying one. I'm just at so-and-so right. gym and I yeah. don't know how to use this. I'm like, all right, well get a coffee. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk to you here for as long as it takes. So education was a huge part of that for sure. And, um, cause I don't, don't want to get stuck in the weeds cause we could talk about equipment, equipment sales, customers. It's been for a long, a long time. it's been a long 10 years. <laughs> but, um, from that we transitioned into to where we wanted to just go out and do some seminars. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the start of mm -hmm the education on the road in terms of, I think that's when we really saw you shine in terms of presenting and going okay and how the tactical demographics started leaning mm -hmm. towards what you were putting out. Not everyone was leaning towards it, but you really resonated with these because you had experience mm -hmm. compared to those who didn't. Um, so can you kind of talk us through that starting from, you got Jason, the coach, you got Jason, the, um, equipment educator and seller, and now you've got Jason, the seminar presenter, yeah. all happening. And you have other stuff on the side too. <laughs> and so the gym, and yeah. I was a cop for a while. <laughs> it's been a busy, busy run. Um, so when do things click for you? Like, oh, the seminars or education, really, this is where I want to hone in on. And then why did you hone in on the tactical community? So really, I think a lot of it is just the, the kind of the exchange, almost like a selfish, like dopamine, you know, as silly as that sounds. Um, in a former life, doing some other work in other countries, uh, there was some cool guys we worked with. And I remember when we first got into, in, you know, gotten in country, my qualifications to switch to the chief communicator of our group yeah. was that I was the youngest. <laughs> We're using radios I'd never seen before. And there's pretty gnarly dudes running around with beards and spray painted everything. And I remember just at 22 years old in like, I remember having a beard like we have. Yeah. I, dude, I had two pubes sticking off my face <laughs> in this damn country. But like, kind of coming there with it tucked between my legs and just, hey, man, like, we're, we have like a 12-hour convoy tomorrow, and I don't know how to use any of these radios. Like, and the dude, cool as can be, on watch for the evening, he's like, go get some coffees. I'll teach you everything. 
So that dude, like this fella I'd never met before in a country I'd never been to, took me under his wing and groomed me, taught radios at a high level fast. And it was like, well, that was, that was pretty good experience and taught us enough information to stay alive. So that, I didn't really realize it, but that experience was kind of like a seed that was planted. Yeah. And when we started communicating um, and people, you build a rapport or a relationship or, or something resonates with folks that are trusting you to teach them this, you know, the, the volume of books behind you, someone's te- relying on you to translate that and deliver that information to them. For me, it's, it's being on the other side of the table of being able to translate that, provide that communication or different circumstances, but some degree of kind of stay alive or, you know, improvement professionally. And that's when it started to click when that process started happening. And I didn't know it was happening um, until you pointed out that like, hey, we're getting pretty good at this. You know, th- things are going well. Yeah. And it was like, okay, cool. And then it was really time to to dive in and double down on the, not necessarily the craft of, but at least the the practice of communicating and coaching and, and never really losing your head that you know, we, we had a task was simply to communicate all this information and make it digestible for end users. And yeah. when we started the West Side for Sports, um, you blindsided me with the maximal athletic development, but, you know, sink yeah. or swim. And then as it transitioned to these tactical populations, um, that's when it got really neat because we were seeing an improvement in quality of life. Yeah. And, you know, I had some experience, you know, went to some places, wasn't a soft dude. And my police time was, you know, five years in, in both, both military and police, but got to work with a lot of really cool units and a lot of really cool dudes based strictly off of some blind luck, kind of yeah. like here. And uh, just basically competency, like just what you don't know, just put in the reps till you get a, a foothold and then figure it out kind of thing. And when all of that started to gel and we started figuring out the the concepts for this tactical thing, that was as it is now, you know, it's known as conjugate tactical now and all that good stuff, but it was the work we did for yeah. the better part of half a decade, at least solely training and, and communicating with or teaching police, fire, military, you name it. And, you know, cool. Like if we call it something else or the work just needed to get done. Yeah. And when it started to really gel with these guys that, Hey, we're, we're feeling better. It yeah. was like, Oh shit. And that was the moment where it's like, okay, now we've got to, we've got to run with it. And when the conjugate club launched, that was, that was essentially the catalyst for conjugate tactical and the communicating and all the stuff that we do now. So, so it, it in some way, shape or form, it goes all the way back to Oh five with a, a passion's a dangerous word, but a, at least a, an ethical set of rules on how yeah. and why to communicate and uh, a pretty good code of conduct for how we treat people. So it's, it's been a pretty neat, pretty neat experience. But if, unless I'm mistaken, I think that's how it kind of all came to be. <laughs> yeah. And from our point of view, uh, in the beginning, like Louie didn't like the thought of doing seminars, the mm-hmm. actual execution, he was like tickled to death when people came in. He'd never admitted, but like, he was, oh, yeah. he loved to talk to people, loved people wanted to learn. But the anticipation of a seminar, like, no, and then the aftermath of the seminar, like, why? And uh, you had, you said, AJ, Laura, um, Chris Mason, Justin Tooley, uh, Shane, mm-hmm. were doing the CrossFit. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was it. And uh, AJ did the special strengths certificate that seminar. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Lou was like, okay, we're, we're not going to do these for a yeah. while. And then uh, AJ and Laura and Shane hit the road doing the CrossFit seminars. But what was unique was he saw in what you were doing was like, oh, you've made this your own. You've taken this, made it your own. And very few people, I don't think anyone can really say it, that, oh, you got the the blessing. Like, hey, go do tactical because it's a demographic that I'm not going to get into directly. Mm -hmm. We have all these visitors coming in because we have people coming in like, hey, how can we use this? How can we use this? And then Louis was like, talk to Gus. Mm -hmm. And... um, because he saw the, okay, you've taken what you learned here, made it your own, still give reference back, said how fundamental principles as based on our mm-hmm. system. And then it just morphed and it, it didn't, it was never in your face, which was like, it's awesome to see how much has grown mm. in the background. It's never been like, oh, here, this is the next best thing. Yeah. And it's, um, it's always been based in reason, mm-hmm. right? There has to be some sort of logic behind what you're doing. Very much so. Yeah. And I mean, a, a lot of it is too is you know just just as most of us have talked especially since he's passed but everyone was tasked with proving the system yeah you know whether it's Laura on the platform 
or any of the guys inside the octagon, any, any number of ways to prove the system. And for, for you and I and the guys that were doing the seminar stuff and gals, but um, I think proving the system was your tasking, not improve. It's a perfect system. And the, the proof of concept or the way to sort of function check this whole thing is can you translate it to a demographic with a desired outcome and then make that happen? And that was the that was simple. If Lou would have told us, like, hey, go become the loudest, abrasive, wannabe professional wrestler on the planet, would have gone and done that. I mean, yeah. we would have kicked our ass, but would have gone and done that. But he said, simply go prove the system. And <clears throat> I don't I don't know. I'm not going to say respectfully because there's a, there's a lot of them out there, but <laughs> I don't know what kind of person would thumb their nose at the institution and pretend that strength and conditioning, as we know it in 2022, does not translate back to something from yeah. this place. Yeah. You know what I mean? So whatever, I don't know how it's how you're raised or getting my ass kicked so many damn times, but the, we had a simple task and hopefully we did it right. And you know, I'm, I'm stoked that he got to see some of, cause there's not a lot of, not a lot of it out there. We've always said, yeah. you don't have to be, we don't have to be the, the best known. We just have to be the best at yeah. doing this whole thing. And for him to see and get some of the feedback or phone calls of, of what this accidentally really turned into was like, okay, cool. You know, it was like, I think last time I saw him was December of last year and he was tickled to death with what we were doing. He wouldn't admit it, you know, he'd still yeah. call you an asshole and everything, but it, it was really a, a neat thing and we're still working. Don't get me wrong, but um, as it is now, it's, it's pretty cool of what's kind of come to be. Well, the drop-ins, right? That's what used to be hilarious. Just like this, this guy from this place just dropped in mm -hmm. and you're like, oh yeah. And then he was like, they said that the Gus sent him. <laughs> like, wh wh why does Gus know these people? And he'd be just so perplexed of why these random military guys would just drop uh, in, drop out. Um, yeah, there's yeah. the there's the one. <laughs> we we both know who it is. A, yeah. a gentleman, we'll just call him C. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank God he was in the parking lot the day we were in here I working on that. something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I knew his love for short shorts and your love for short shorts. Oh, yeah. It was a <laughs> match made in heaven right yeah, there. So in, in some way, shape, or form, this whole damn thing is your Based fault. Based on silkies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so getting into that and knowing the different demographics, mm -hmm. uh, is there a big difference the way you approach the tactical sector? And forgive me if the nomenclature is wrong, but like I mean, there's a lot. Tactical means a lot of things. And it it's really a, it's, does. It's a buzzword, mm -hmm. but... When you work with athletes mm -hmm. and just say you work with someone in law enforcement, then you work with someone in the military, is it does it differ on a major level and a minor level? How does it all work? I, I would say it's it's more the subtleties of. So uh, John Quint, he kind of he introduced that concept of capacity over demand. So that's yeah. the the underlying theme really in all that we've done is step one before we start doing burpees and push presses and sprints and all you, whatever you want to call the actual stimulus um, before we start doing that we simply identify the capacity or the desired outcome and with the actual execution of training it may vary but the overlying theme is is capacity over demand so if we're working with a cop depending on where he or she's at in their career if we're getting you ready for something administrative like the police academy well, we don't need to worry too much about road stuff. Right now, we have to get you through the academy. Yeah. If the PT requirements or the physical training requirements at the academy are laughable, well, cool. We'll just train you on top of that. But if that academy class or that two-mile run or 50 push-ups, whatever it is, is kicking your butt, well, we got to get you ready for that, which in severity is no different than 13 years of, of training MMA dudes. Yeah. You know, And from the highest level down to the beginner, it's like, well, that's pretty cool. And when I say training, the strength side, not the skill side. Yeah. Um, so really, it kind of transcends all of that. And then really, if, if we can give away some of the cheat codes, because really that's, that's what we're doing with tactical now, is basically giving it away. Like, there's, no yeah. more, there's no more hours in the day that we can work, yeah. ultimately. You know, So it's time to bring other people into it. But if we give it away... Um, looking at the whole thing is, is take notes still like, and one, I'm just not tough enough to have accomplished the soft stuff back in the day, but working with the dudes and keeping a notepad and still learning from these guys and, and maintaining that understanding of capacity over demand, you can really transcend as long as you keep your morals about you, you can really transcend any of these demographics or these populations um, and really learn what these folks need. And more often than not, 
where we, again, terrible at marketing, but for us, intensity is usually not the answer. Yeah. Most of our folks are so stubborn that they're going to, and I say that respectfully, but they're so stubborn, they're going to knuckle down and get done what you ask them to get done. And a lot of times it's building that trust and rapport to convince them to save them from themselves, mm -hmm. you know, cause I, these are some, these are some pretty good, tough guys and gals. And if you tell them a hundred of these or 50 of these, they're going to get them. But if 30 was the right call, they need to trust you as the coach to make sure that they stop at the right time and you're not screwing them around and that kind of stuff. So it's a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff that goes into all this. Um, when you get the call to go work with a particular demographic, mm -hmm. do you go with, uh, you have a foundation that you're going to work with and then you listen and then you uh, cater your educational knowledge to what they need? Mm -hmm. Or do you go in like, here is the system, this is it, take it or leave it? So to take a simple answer and, and make it more complicated, because that's kind cool. of my MO, <laughs> really, we, we're, we're not catering to everyone. Right? As Lou said, it's a way, even when I met him first time, a way, not the way that stuck with me for 13 years now. And when we roll into these things, we can, we can deliver our services. So like yep. when we do the coaches course or our workshops, those are set and repeatable and designed to, you know, bring others into that fold. When we do our private work where this whole thing started, we have the foundation. So that foundation and the, these fundamental principles are not going to change so that's the base of your pyramid. And then when we kind of shift left or right into a group or a unit or a team, whatever it is we're working with, we'll either have some, some screening calls or some, some sessions where I'm learning of what's needed. And then with some of our extended network, if, if it's something that we can't handle, mm -hmm. we have someone that can. So some of this stuff, getting guys ready for this or that unit and whatnot, if we can't handle it, we've got a guy that can. So really, if we use the 80 20 rule, maybe closer to 60 40, 70 30, we, we can do almost anything that comes across our plate. And if we can't, we, we've, we've told people no, like we're not your right fit, especially if people want, you know, like a, I, I just call it an experiential thing. They just want us to come out and, and haze their SWAT team or something for the yeah. novelty. Like, but that's not who we are, man. I can't yeah. do that. But if you want us to come out and talk about using the, the methods and the system for this particular job or, or this population or subpopulation, even we can do that quite well. And a lot of it is, is grabbing those subtleties for a private job or private work, yeah. um, grabbing those subtleties and being able to adapt. And I think that that's where putting in the reps and watching that initial panel of, of instructors be able to field almost any and all questions, having that, that deep understanding of the, the foundation and the roots of all of this stuff, dating back to the Dynamo Club and all of it, being able to understand that at a level that you can cut paste and shift that data into the right set of ears. Another interesting uh, observation watching how you work compared to others is that it's usually never a one-time deal mm. in that whoever you work with, you tend to, I always say you're the king of smoozing because you're very good. <laughs> you're very good at making a, a communication <laughs> with people whether they want to or not. Um, but that has a value in it that is you can have the best education system in the world, you can have the best training in the world, but if you can't communicate it and you can't um, assimilate people into the culture for the buy-in, mm -hmm. and that's a big thing I think that's lost. I think a lot of people go out there and go, look at me, I am the best, this is the best. But you completely disarm the whole situation, whether it's through humor, <laughs> self-deprecation, whatever it is. But everyone keeps going, uh, coming back. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you could kind of touch on that to kind of your art towards uh, coaching and relationships. Yeah. So to preface it, not, not all of them come back. Even, even from our own little tribe we've built, there's some of them out there head hunting me. They, we piss somebody off somewhere. I'm certain. And most likely they're probably in my phone book, but, yeah. um, when it comes to a lot of it is really like, man, if you look left, and thank God I got the right direction because I know we're on camera. But if you look left, you might be the man. But if you look over here, you're the rookie or the beginner at something. And I think that's the individual decision. If you want to stay over here and be the man in a room full of of whatever you want to call it, you know, people you, you've outclassed in, in yeah. some capacity. Like, you know, if, if you're the best boxer at a practice, you probably need to go to a new practice and become the worst. And with the guys we've hung out with, we hang out with a lot of people that can 
kick my ass and have kicked my ass. So having a guy half your size on your chest beating you up that you can out deadlift will keep you humble. Yeah. And uh, I think if more strength coaches grappled, they'd change their tune pretty quick, understand it's a part of the formula. But I think all, you know, all the jokes and, and the goofy things aside, that's just who I am. Like plenty of people have tried to take me off this planet. And at this point, it, a lot of stuff, just funny. You don't have to take it all so yeah. serious, you know, but a lot of it, I, I believe truly is caring about the individual. So having a military background and seeing what some of these young guys and gals are up against, it's like, oh, man, you know, you got to give back to these areas you leave. You don't just stack up bodies and stand on them like you yeah. want to you want to leave it better than you found it. And sometimes you can't leave it better till 10 or 15 years after the fact. But if we can help them, it's a good feeling. And, you know, date back to that story about the the cool guy with the radios. I'm not saying I'm the cool guy with the radios, but now it, it truly is a chance to reflect not only the brand, but the legacy, the history and all that stuff that comes from here and translate it to a group and, and treat them well as well as you know care about their outcome and well-being and enjoy the process like I said, yeah. if, if it was miserable i would not be all over the country keeping my you know my butt working i'd be online talking about how great i am and all you have to do is sign up for this ten dollar this and four dollar that and bleed everyone to death but i'd rather personally go out and work as hard as we can for our folks and not lose sight of prove my system you know it's a very simple task and you know it, it's it, it may be a little cheesier or kind of, you know, quasi romantic about the subject, but like lose past, obviously. And the, the task is open. It's an open ended task. You know, he never, maybe he's here. He's like, okay, it's proven. Now you can do something else. But that conversation never happened. Yeah. So we have to keep proving the system and our way to prove the system is try to treat people as best as you can, because date back to 09, that there's no reason that man should have taken me under his wing, you know? <laughs> some idiot sitting in the crowd with a notebook and I probably stole a pen cause I was so damn broke, <laughs> but, um, being mindful of those, those stories and those experiences and the very fact that someone's better and someone's tougher, that'll, that's been sort of our foundation that we've launched all of our communication and our effort from is, is don't forget where you came from. Don't forget who built you up and someone can punch you in the nose. No matter how, I don't care if you got a blue check mark, man, getting punched in the nose hurts. <laughs> Um, what are some of your uh, biggest takeaways from Lou? Uh, definitely the the statement "a way, not the way." Um, you see, guys, guys and gals go off the rails so dug in that they can't adapt, and that's that's the biggest takeaway. Um, to the other principles that go with it, it's really like it's try not to look too far. You don't forget where you came from, but. You know, Lou, I've never seen him treat someone with disrespect. You know, everyone comes in here, a visitor, a student in some capacity, and you get the best version of Lou and the experience that you can get. And being able to do that, some of these, you, you know, some folks are, you're a mark. They're going to bleed you dry, bad mouth you all the way to the bank or whatever you want to call it. But Lou never stopped treating people well. Yep. So that was one of those things where it's like, you can't have the goldfish brain in this industry and last, at least in our culture yeah. here so you have to keep looking forward forget the those kind of things those experiences because if you can impact these people and you don't let yourself become jaded then the process gets better you know being mindful someone 10 20 years from now is going to build something that we can't even fathom yeah and being part of that you know formula is huge that's how you advance the craft or the art of strength and conditioning and then the the no excuses thing man like watching that man it's night and day. We could crack jokes down here, yeah. laughing, you know, all this, that, and the other. And the further you get, the further you get down the parking lot, the closer you get to the gym doors. That's when the shift happens. And like when it's time to train, it's like, no, we're not talking work. We're not talking business. Don't give a shit. Train. Yeah. And that's that's one of those things, especially doing the same thing for so long now that when we do some of these seminars or these events or people are visiting the gym it can slowly transition into a three hour sidebar and training becomes second hand to, mm -hmm. or second fiddle to, you know, whatever you want to call com interacting and hanging out. And some, some folks may think, Oh, that was easier than lifting weights, but training is still first. We're yep. strength coaches. I don't care what comes across your plate or who knows you, your job is to get human beings stronger. And I don't think that he ever lost sight of that. And it's like, okay, you, you sure as hell better not lose sight of that either. <laughs> what are some of your um, 
most memorable visits? Because uh, you made like there was a period in time where you're coming down nearly every week or every second week for years. Yeah. Um, one, the the army fella we met in the parking lot. Yeah. C. And so that one's huge for obvious reasons. For, uh, obvious yeah. reasons, you know, internal reasons. Um, though uh, the first you can't you can't undo the first experience here from getting into town barely had enough to stay at the Econo Lodge for two nights. No idea what industry drive was because the GPS back then just yeah. took you down Valley View. So finding the gym, going in there and just having that like, oh, shit, like this is this is it. Yeah. Then, I mean, the you kicked me out of the gym one time <laughs> for some. I remember a younger kid was on the ATP and he was not having a great time. And I went to you know spot him and get him out of there. And I was promptly reminded where I'm at that this man is here to train, like you need to go walk around the parking lot, <laughs> think about where you're at and I'll figure out if you can come back in the gym. <laughs> it's like, okay, I screwed that one up. That's my bad. Um, hell the, the maximum athletic development seminar. Hey, come on out, like comp your seat, sit here, you know, observe the seminar. Cool. And then 10, 20 minutes before we get on the road to drive five hours. Hey, you're speaking for 20 minutes. Click. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> you know, yeah. so that's, you know, those are all like wonderful, nostalgic memories. But still, even even coming out here now, like I can't remember every visit because there's yeah. been so many. But there's not a time I don't come out here and get better at something. So each time you come out here and, and you know, kind of breathe it in and all that stuff, you you take something away, even if it's watching people come here for their first time and stuff like that. I, I would have to honestly say like during the Arnold open houses and stuff like that, being able to be the, the, what do you want to call it? Not the vessel, but the, the lifeline for someone to have their first experience here yeah. or the fellow who's been saving to drive out here and could finally get out here to be able to represent that every single time has been all those memories, regardless of the date or the event, but just being part of that process for so many years has been like, that's, that's the one thing we can hang our hat on is like we, whatever came across our plate, if it was Jason from West Side, we hopefully delivered it. Yeah. And every time that we did, it was like, dude, this like what a fucking awesome story. You know, this has just been a hell of a hell of a ten year run. <laughs> um, to segue back into training, mm. if you have someone out there who is uh, in the military, mm -hmm. what are some of the tips that you can give them? Hey. If, if you could focus on these three things to help you keep in a particular level of shape, what would it be? Hamstrings. Just all, everything hamstring. Train your hamstrings for knee health, human performance, and anything you come across your plate before you slip. Because when you're 19, 20 and bulletproof and have cartilage, <laughs> yeah. it's all great. And everyone swears that father time's not going to catch up to them, that they're the exception. So all that preventative maintenance stuff. And there's a lot of folks doing amazing stuff like yeah. under John's world, you know, but to train the hamstrings, glutes and low back, if, if not for human performance and squatting a truck and all that strictly for preventative maintenance, that would be where I would start. And then in the process of being mindful of if I could do it again, the, the PFT standards, it's the simplest formula on the planet. Just exist above those standards and you'll have way better scores. Yeah. You're, back then it was 20 pull-ups for the Marines. And it was like, holy shit, 20 pull-ups. And then as soon as you get out of the Marines and your life isn't 20 pull-ups, it's like 20 pull-ups was never that big of a deal. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I would say to really run, run north of what's required of you and build up the posterior chain. As generic as that sounds, like when you hit cross that 30s into mid 30s, late 30s, um, all that damage, I think, comes to the surface. And if you could put a pair of ass cheeks and hamstrings on these young guys out there, I think it's going to carry them further when they hit our age yeah. <laughs> than what we have. Because I'd, I'd never heard of posterior chain when I was 19. But I had plenty of time going uphill, bent over with a backpack. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you notice a change in how you structure workouts based on age? Yep. So usually, and, it, and it's not a catch-all rule, yep. but if we have to make some sort of professional stereotype, the younger and more full of enthusiasm someone has, typically the more they want as far as exercise variety goes and the less they need. So they need yep. a lot of a little more than a little of a lot. So getting away from the, the circuits and the sprints and the medleys and all that kind of stuff, usually those folks need a lot of dense 
repetitive work to not necessarily undo damage, but prevent future issues from occurring. Mm -hmm. And we get it, we get our ethically get our hooks in them young and try and keep them on what we hope is the right path. They tend to feel better two or three years down the road or their run times increase in a good way. You know, they speed up. Um, so that's where we go into the young ones. As far as the older populations or where we've really kind of landed our message is that aging tactical athlete, as you get through your first phase of, of mm -hmm. career, you know, is to not necessarily disarm because again, these are, these are pretty gnarly dudes and gals we work with, but kind of disarm or at least segue in the communication that we're, we don't want to smash you, destroy your back or anything like that is to trust and use these methods to build you up. So usually putting in work that most folks would not see coming from, you know, West Side Barbell of low intensity, ultra high volume stuff to strengthen the low back, yeah. to traction via the reverse hyper, or again, save you from yourself. Cause some of those folks will also want to stay as hard nosed as they were when they were 21. And it's like, well, you're again, you might be your own worst enemy in that case. So that's where building that rapport and long-term relationship with a lot of our folks has helped us see them into different phases of career and whatnot. So we kind of ramp up the right work yeah. for the older or, you know, the aging tactical athlete and try to get our hooks in and save our younger guys from themselves because some of them are crazy. I remember one of the Navy dudes we work with, I was putting his workout together and it was supposed to be like three sets of like 50 or something like that for like seated uh, leg curls. I think it was three by 50. It was supposed to be low intensity, like a finisher. And I actually hit two zeros. So this hard bastard did three sets of 500 and then proceeded to send me a message about how smoked his hamstrings were. I'm like, God, I'm, that's my bad. But I mean, that's the thing. Like that, yeah. that's entirely extreme ownership. My bad. <laughs> yeah. But these people are, are so hard nosed in such a great way that you're like, Oh shit. Like you just did 1500 leg curls. <laughs> like, and without even batting an eye. So yeah. that's where the hesitancy and in, in more intensity is not always the answer. Um, that's, that's our big split really is ethically try to trick our folks into doing what they need to do. <laughs> when you, um, when you initially meet a group or a demographic, is there a stereotypical pushback be, be like before they hear what you have to say and like get into the culture, into the system? Mm -hmm. Is there an initial standoff? Are these people already bought in before you get there? There's some. So, I mean, a lot of it depends on the context. A lot of our private work, if so, we're, we're not very well known, but we work a lot. Um, so the word of mouth has helped us disarm for lack of a better term, yeah. you know, it has helped us be received in some of these groups a little bit more than we were three to five years ago. And that we've got a lot of trust yeah. that it's not just me. We've got other folks on the team too, but we've got a lot of trust with a lot of pretty reputable people. So a lot of that big picture, you know, winning over to prison yard kind of thing has, has subdued or subsided, pardon me. And you'll, I mean, you'll always have the antagonist or someone who just doesn't trust you, but that's the challenge of like, yeah. you know, this is a, a proven system and our application tends to help most people. It's like, we're going to get this fella to do what we want him to do for his own well being, And you can call it whatever you want. I don't care if conjugate tactical trade changed his life or he repackages it into his own thing for whatever reason, as long as he's performing better, yeah. that's the ultimate goal as a coach. So a lot of that has really started to subside. And then when we go into back into the public space, you've always got one or two that will fight you on everything. And that's yeah. fine. You know, you should, you should punch as many holes in this thing. As Lou always said, like, if you got a better way to train, I'll do it, but you don't, yeah. <laughs> you know? So we, we get some of it, but I would say over the years and, and through refinement of our ability to communicate and also the learning more. You know, the, there's if we just look at SWAT teams where we do a lot of our police work, um, the the tasking of even a full time team down to a part time team in a rural county versus a big city, the more we learn and the more reps we get to put in, the better the message gets and the better the service becomes. And a lot of it has died down because we do have where we work, we do have a decent reputation or we wouldn't be going through the doors we go through. Yeah. And I, I think that that takes time. So. Hopefully the, the trust has been built in our, in our tribe, in our community to the point where we're not walking into a room full of dead eyes wanting to hate your guts. Yeah. Cause we, we went through that phase. <laughs> <laughs> when, um, you're working with a group, mm -hmm. uh, working with an individual, um, are you looking at the short term basis 
or are you looking at hey this is uh based on longevity this is while you're active this is what you're doing and hey when you're finished you have a life too are you mm -hmm. looking at the broad spectrum of things or are you looking at hey we're going to get you through this phase so for me if the the few individuals that i do work with it's a little bit of both for large you know broad stroke group training yep. it's definitely both and that that's just having an understanding of these professions so we have an immediate goal like we have to improve your strength and conditioning right now because your job requires it and in that context i tend to think more first responder than than big mill yeah big military you know um you know, so you have a cop, whatever it is, where you're an absolute fire breathing machine, or you might have let yourself go after a year of midnights, we got to get you back on task. So for the short term, we need to safely do whatever it takes to improve that strength conditioning because you need it. The yeah. gas tank, the maximal strength, all that stuff. Being mindful that while we're taking care of the immediate, we have a big picture vision or a long term goal of, you know, full range of motion, better mobility, gas tank all the markers you'd get on a blood panel. And as you mentioned, life after service or, you know, after retirement in that we don't want to redline you for five, 10 years, whatever it is we work together, mm -hmm. redline you and then disappear to the point where it's like, well, that was great, but now everything is blown out. My knees don't work, you know, yeah. um, as far as like phase training, a majority of that is done by our coaches now. So if it's a short term gig for lack of a better term, someone, you know, three months, six months training, I really, really don't do a lot there anymore, um, especially since Eddie's retired. There's, yeah. a, there's really not a lot of individual coaching anymore, but that's really our theme. And when we do try to work with coaches is teach them the split. Like you can do all the immediate, but that being mindful of that end state or that long-term goal of high quality life and wellness on top of human performance is that that's kind of where I really believe we've separated ourselves, not in a not a condescending way, but we've taken a, a very specific path, which isn't yeah. always that lucrative or sexy, and it definitely doesn't market all that well. Yeah. But that's where that's where we work for better or worse. And that tends to be what works. A lot of us need a short term goal to work towards. And then we organize enough short term goals or midterm goals and you have a 15, 20 year career completely yeah. done. You know, obviously I haven't worked with someone for 20 years, but um, we've got some guys that have been under the belt for 12 or 13 with us for sure. So to go through or to recap, you came here at the seminar, mm -hmm. you got introduced to Louie, then you kept in touch. You, Eddie wore the jumper or the hoodie yeah. and then you got into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Then Conjure Tactical was born mm -hmm. and the vast majority of that start was behind the scenes, private, building up with different groups. And now um, it's awesome to see that there's a transition to where you're actually making this more approachable to public. Yeah. And can you talk a bit about that, about the evolution of Conjugate Tactical, where it's at and the courses you're putting out there? Yeah. So as you mentioned, this, this was the work. I mean, this was the organization of training, which is really what it boils down to is the work that I've done here for years. Yeah. It just didn't have a name. It was just simply call this guy, go this place, but whatever we need, you yeah. know what I mean? And when that started to top out again, it coincided with the launch of the conjugate club. But when that started to really top out, it was like, Oh, the, we've got a thing. So I remember when we were kind of putting the course together, this concept of coaching, the coaching course, um, it was like, we just can't take on any more work. Jason, the individual can't go, all these places, but this information's in demand. So, yep. you know, how do we move this whole needle forward or move the ball forward? So the coaching course was pitched and the direction from HQ, you know, don't screw it up. <laughs> so I'm sure we make some missteps like any human being, but as the coaches course started to develop in which, you know, we, there's a way, not the way, yep. but move it forward. We've run through five over the last three years, pardon me, four, you know, three years, we've run five public coaches courses. So we top those out. We try to top them out at 24. Mm -hmm. You know, we have one, we're not going to say no if it's 25, but I'm not effective in large groups beyond 24. We can manage 24 people and give them a wonderful experience. We've done one private uh, for some DHS folks and that has taken us to where we're at now. Yeah. So that, that enables to add whatever we've built, whatever this is to add it to coaches arsenals of, of training so that they can 
in time build something far superior to what we can do. Uh, we ha- we've had the TIP workshop, so it's it's similar to the West Side for Sports. We we have a day together to kind of introduce you to some concepts, and we'll see where that goes from here. Mm-hmm. The private work we do is that's like we said just not get out in the weeds. The private work we do is a, a five day conversation, yeah. but that private work is the that's all the the proving grounds of the system. Yeah. And now the public side of it is please go get your private work as the individual and build a nice life as well. Um, and then we've the the other course we provide is the dash two, so it's not a level two, but we drink from a fire hose for a day and a half at the at the coach's course. Yeah. And for folks that's like, hey, this is kind of scratching that itch for me as a strength coach, we need a little bit more. <laughs> so we do a one day follow on called the Dash Two. And sometimes it's a day and a half, but yeah. the Dash Two. And that's where a lot of our coaches come back and everyone it I shouldn't say everyone, but the folks that come to the Dash Two will come numerous times and be able to contribute something. Yeah. So it's almost like a, a collective, well, we still want to give you information and new things. The guys that come back have insane things that they've created and it, it adds to the value of the group. So that's really where it's transitioned into now is we're still working just as we were in 2015, 2016 mm-hmm. with all our, our private groups and, and things of that nature. And what, with the release of the club, that was our, our segue into the public side and the guys and gals doing the course are they're they're out there doing the what i would consider to be the cool stuff now yeah they're they're on that new frontier of this this human performance and tactical spec you know the tactical space yeah they're on the frontier of that building the actual framework for individual training versus the broad stroke organization of training so that's you know in a nutshell that's really where it's it's gone dating back from the 09 visit to the launch of the coaches course in 2019 and um what's uh, exciting too is that you have that going on, and um, but you're still part of the educational content team at Westside, mm-hmm. and this is a podcast that hopefully will be a quarterly thing where we, you'll be coming in, answering specific topics, specific questions. Um, but you've never, um, even though you run tactical, you're still like we still have our yeah. our deck clutch on you within here within the education anywhere. side. Um, <laughs> So before we wrap up, the last question I'd like to ask you is, what are you most proud of during your time here so far? Uh, I Honestly, I'd have to say is not getting kicked out. It is sim- as simple as that sounds from the outside looking in. Um, I, we've seen, I think, the best and worst examples of what this place can do to a human being's personality. And to c- just over 10 years plus you know, three years of visits, just knuckle down and work, whether it's taking the trash out during the Arnold weekend, helping people fold shirts, train, host, visit, coach, whatever needs to be done. We've just always done it. So yeah. the, the thing I can honestly say, aside from, you know, all the little individual this, that's in the other is to just have made it this long and not really lost focus of where we came from and what your task is, is to represent the company, treat people well and prove the system. So if it's going to all get put into one thing, that's what I would say is just simply not getting kicked out. And hopefully the reason is not the dumbest person <laughs> and we haven't forgotten who we are or who I am, you know. <laughs> Gus, I appreciate it. 